Hello everyone, Victor is here, your organic chemistry tutor, and in this video I want to take a close look at the Fischer esterification, which is the reaction between the carboxylic acid and an alcohol which is going to result in the formation of the ester products. Reaction typically uses some sort of acid as a catalyst and the reaction is an equilibrium. But let's look at each aspect of this reaction one step at a time so we don't get overwhelmed with the details. Here is an example of a typical Fischer esterification. We are going to start with some sort of a carboxylic acid. In this case I'm using a butanoic acid. And I'm going to react it with the propanol, which is an alcohol. As I've mentioned a moment ago, we'll need an acid, some sort of strong inorganic acid as a catalyst, so here I'm going to use sulfuric acid H2SO4 as my catalyst. This reaction is going to produce an ester as a product, and we are also going to have water as our co-product. As I've mentioned, the reaction is an equilibrium, so if I want to drive this equilibrium to completion, I'm going to be using the Le Chatelier principle and I'm going to be either using the high concentration of one of my starting materials or, what is more common, we are going to be removing water to drive our reaction to completion. Typically, we are going to be removing water either by using the azeotropic reflux or by using four angstrom molecular sieves. So, if your instructor or a textbook writes something like this, four angstrom molecular sieves, they mean a specific technique that we are going to be using to remove that water. But that is not the most important part of this reaction. The important part here is the mechanism mechanism of the reaction itself, which you are most likely going to be tested on the exam. And when it comes to the mechanism of this reaction, the first thing that I am going to do, I will redraw my carboxylic acid, like so, and the first step here is going to be to protonate our carboxylic acid. Carboxylic acid by itself is not particularly electrophilic, and alcohol that we are using here as our core reagent is not very nucleophilic, which means that in order for these two species to react with each other, we either need to increase the nucleophilicity of the alcohol or we need to increase the electrophilicity of our carboxylic acid. And we are going to go with the latter option. And this is where the sulfuric acid is going to come at play. Sulfuric acid is a very strong inorganic acid and it can easily protonate the carboxylic acid. And there are two places where the protonation can occur. We can either protonate the upper oxygen, the one that I have over here, uh, the part of my carbonyl, so that protonation is going to look like this, the oxygen is going to reach out and grab the proton from the sulfuric acid, giving me an intermediate that looks like that, or there is another potential option, and in that option we are going to use the other oxygen, the OH group, and if we are using that one, we are going to do this protonation like so, giving me the following intermediate. But that raises a reasonable question, which protonation is going to be correct in this case? And while we may want to make this OH into our living group, this is actually not the way to go, and the correct protonation is going to be at the carbonyl. And the main reason why we are going to be protonating carbonyl rather than the OH group Group, is that forming this protonated intermediate is going to actually give us a resonance stabilized intermediate where I can show the resonance contributor that I already have on the screen or I can show another resonance contributor which looks like this. The bottom one, however, has absolutely no resonance and on top of that we have this oxygen with a positive charge and the lack of the electron density sitting right next to a carbon which already has a significant delta plus charge because the carbonyl polarization going to put that plus charge onto that carbon. So you're going to end up with two positively charged atoms or partially positively charged atoms right next to each other, which is going to be thermodynamically unstable. So remember, whenever you're going to be protonating a carboxylic acid or a carboxylic acid derivative, always do that at the carbonyl position and not at the OH position. So now, when we know where exactly we're going to be protonating our carboxylic acid, the next question is, well, what's the next step? What are we going to do next? Well, the protonated carboxylic acid is a pretty good electrophile and the only nucleophile that we have floating in the system is going to be our alcohol, which is our propanol. So that alcohol can do the nucleophilic attack on our carbonyl, so these electrons attack the carbon and electrons from the CO double bond going to go onto the oxygen. This nucleophilic attack is going to give us the following intermediate where 
the new bond that we have created, the new carbon-oxygen bond, is right over here. Next, we are going to get rid of the proton on our oxygen and we are going to protonate one of our other oxygens to convert that into a living group. Typically, that's going to be a two-step process, two proton transfers where we are going to be using a chaperone. The most likely chaperone in this case is going to be another equivalent of propanol that we have floating around, so we are going to use that propanol to pull the proton off our protonated species like this, giving me a neutral tetrahedral intermediate and then we are going to use our chaperone to add proton onto the other oxygen giving us the following intermediate and in this case our H2O plus that I have right over here well that creates an excellent leaving group so that leaving group can now dissociate and we are going to use one of the oxygens to help in this process so uh, we are going to kick our H2O out giving us the following intermediate. The result of this leaving group dissociation is going to give us an another resonance stabilized intermediate where one resonance structure looks like what I have on the screen and the other resonance structure we can easily draw by pushing our electrons around like so, giving us the following resonance contributor. And the last step from this point is going to be to get rid of this proton over here to give us a neutral species and we can do so by using another equivalent of our alcohol that we have floating around, so this guy is going to come in, pull this proton off, giving us our ester, which is our final product in this case. Now, as I've mentioned a moment ago, this reaction is an equilibrium. So if I wanted to be the, you know, absolutely correct with my uh, mechanism drawing, I should draw the equilibrium arrows for each step in my reaction. So if I want to be particularly nitpicky, I would have to draw each step of my reaction like this. Pay close attention to how your instructor does the uh, reaction mechanism in your class, and if your instructor requires you to show the equilibrium arrows, make sure that you draw the equilibrium arrows here and not just one-sided arrows how I did. Now, another thing that I want to point out concerns the proton transfers that I have here in this box. The correct way to show this proton transfer is to do it via the chaperone the way I show it here in two steps. However, there is a very common shortcut that some instructors and even some textbooks use sometimes, and that is a direct shortcut where you are taking the proton and just bumping it from one oxygen into the other one within the molecule itself, the intramolecular process, so to speak. While this is a common shortcut, this shortcut would require you to have a four-membered ring transition state like that, which is just physically not going to be feasible for these types of reactions. So if your instructor does the shortcut where you are just jumping uh, from one oxygen into the other oxygen within the molecule itself, I suppose you could do it like this, but just keep in mind that this is not a strictly speaking quote-unquote legal shortcut because that's not the way the molecular orbitals work. And if your instructor does that, that probably is not going to be okay anywhere outside of your classroom. So be very careful with the shortcut like that. Now, knowing the mechanism is of course important, however, when it comes to the mechanism of this reaction, you're probably not going to have enough time on the exam to draw the mechanism for every single version of this reaction. So it's it's equally important to be able to visualize the product of this reaction without having to go through the entire mechanism. So, for instance, let's say we have a reaction between butanoic acid and isopropanol, and now we are using tazilic acid over here as our catalyst. Well, in this case, I can definitely go through the entire mechanism and figure out how my product is going to look like, or I can use a visualization trick that will help me figure out how the product is going to look like without having to go through the entire mechanism. And here is how it works. What I'm going to do, I'm going to redraw my carboxylic acid over here, so I have my COOH like that, and I'm going to redraw my alcohol, but now I'm going to be pointing the alcohol group towards my carboxylic acid like so. Then I'm going to take this part of the molecule and that is essentially going to become my water. So that goes away as H2O and the leftovers are what I'm going to be connecting together. So in other words, what I can do, 
I will redraw my carboxylic acid here again. So I have my COOH, I have my alcohol pointing towards my carboxylic acid. Now I'm going to grab my eraser and I'm going to erase the OH group of the carboxylic acid. I'm going to erase the hydrogen of my alcohol. Then I'm going to take my alcohol and I'm going to bring it next to my carboxylic acid completing the bond between the carbon and oxygen, and I have my product. The new bond that we have created is right over here, so this is my new bond, and that is our final product. And of course, if you want to double check that that is truly the product in this reaction, you can draw the mechanism and see for yourself. And of course, since I know how much you guys love cyclic compounds and rings and organic chemistry, I couldn't just omit the intramolecular fissure esterification. So whenever we have an intramolecular reaction, that means that the reaction happens within the molecule itself, and it's most likely going to be a cyclization reaction. So for instance, if I have a molecule like that, where I have the carboxylic acid functional group, and I have an alcohol within the molecule itself, there is a very high chance that these two functional groups can react with each other, making a cycle. In this case, we are going to be making a bond between this oxygen over here and this carbon over here, giving me a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, six-membered ring if I were to subject that to the Fischer esterification conditions. And of course the conditions here are going to be some sort of acid as a catalyst, so let's say we're going to do something like let's say H2SO4 as our catalyst, and as a result we are going to end up with a six-membered ring, which is going to be something of this sort with an oxygen as a part of our ring, and of course we are going to have a carbonyl over here as well. If I renumber all of my atoms again, I'm going to have my atoms 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So just like as I predicted initially, I'm making a bond between oxygen, which is my atom number 1, and uh, carbon number 6, which is a new bond right over here. But let's write the mechanism for this reaction and see how we can make this product. So first what I'm going to do here, I'm going to redraw my starting material, my carboxylic acid that contains the alcohol. There we go. The next step is going to be to protonate our carboxylic acid, and we know that we are always going to be protonating that at the carbonyl position. So I'm going to draw my sulfuric acid as HO, SO3H like this, and I'm going to grab the electrons of my oxygen on the carbonyl and use those electrons to protonate my carboxylic acid, giving me the following intermediate. We of course do have a resonance structure here. If we are going to take the electrons of this oxygen and move them towards our plus, we can draw another resonance contributor, but for the sake of space here I'm not going to be showing that resonance contributor. Instead, I'm going to move on to the nucleophilic attack right away, and the nucleophile in this case is going to be the part of the molecule itself, so that is going to be our nucleophile, our alcohol that we have inside of the molecule. So in the previous case, we did the nucleophilic attack by the alcohol that is floating around. Now we are going to be doing the nucleophilic attack from the oxygen that is inside of our molecule, and that is going to give me a 1, 2, three, four, five, six-membered ring. So the easiest way to draw the intermediate in this case would be to keep in mind that I first of all have a six-membered ring. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to draw the stem for my molecule where I have a six-membered ring, one of which, one of the atoms inside of that ring is going to be an oxygen. So I will draw a six-membered ring with an oxygen like so, and the next thing that I'm going to do, I will number my atoms, starting with the oxygen, the way I did it on the original molecule. So I have one, two, three, four, five, and six. Now, on oxygen number one, I still have a hydrogen, so I'm going to draw that guy, so I have my OH+, plus. then I don't have anything until I hit carbon number 6. On carbon number 6 I have the OH group, which is going to be this guy over here, so that is this OH group, 
And I also have the new OH that I have just created by moving the electrons on the oxygen, which is that guy. So I'm going to draw that in purple like so, so everything is color coded. Now, the next thing that I'm gonna wanna do here is to take my proton of this oxygen and move it either onto the green OH group or the purple OH group. Which one? It really doesn't matter. I just wanna have one of those groups as a living group. So I'm going to say that we are protonating one of these guys and we are deprotonating my OH at the oxygen number one. Of course, these are going to be two separate steps, but again, for the simplicity's sake, I'm just combining them into one over here. As a result, I'm going to get the following species, and now I have an excellent living group sitting right over here on my molecule, so this is my living group. So next, I'm going to have my living group dissociation, so the electrons from the oxygen going to help kick that living group out, giving me the following intermediate, which of course has a resonance form. We could show the resonance form here by moving our electrons like so, giving me this resonance contributor, and the last bit here would be to deprotonate our molecule and make a final product. And here I'm going to using the sulfate anion or potentially I could use a water that I have just eliminated on the previous step to pull that proton off, like so, giving me the final product, which is going to be my cyclic ester. And another term that we use sometimes for cyclic esters is lactone. So if you hear the term lactone, it is nothing else but the cyclic ester. Now, here is something important that I want to mention about this cyclic version, intramolecular version of the Fischer esterification. When it comes to the ring size, the ring size does matter here. You can easily make seven, six, or five-membered rings. All of these guys are perfectly fine. However, when it comes to a four-membered ring or a three-membered ring, there is absolutely no way you'll be able to make those molecules via the intramolecular fissure esterification. So if you have a four- or three-membered ring potential here, never go for that. That's just not possible in this reaction. However, the five-, six-, and seven-membered rings, those are perfectly fine. And that is all you need to know about the fissure esterification reaction. Remember that this is a reaction that takes the carboxylic acid plus an alcohol, makes the corresponding ester. The reaction can happen intramolecularly, giving you the cyclic ester, which we refer to as a lactone. And also, uh, whenever we are making a ring, we're always going to go five, six, or seven-membered rings, and never the smaller ones. If you want more practice on Fischer esterification or other topics, go to my website, organicchemistrytutor.com, and I have plenty of practice questions about the Fischer esterification and many other topics, and the number of practice questions and tutorials that I have there is growing on a daily basis. As always, thank you for watching. If you have learned something new today, you can tell me that by hitting the like button and leaving me a comment below. Subscribe to the channel for more organic chemistry updates and tutorials, watch this video next, and I'll see you next time!